Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done well over 400 of them by now, and if this is new to you and you'd like to watch other ones, go to the past interviews menu on batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, where you'll see all the previous ones archived in various ways. Uh, this show is pretty much occupies most, almost all of my time and my, wife, my wife's time to do it all, and it's made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and feel like supporting it in any amount, please check out the uh, donation options on batgap.com, including the PayPal button that's on every page of the site. My guest today, uh, I'm glad to say, is the Reverend Cynthia Bourgeau, Ph.D., <laughs> she is an Episcopal priest, teacher, writer, and internationally acclaimed retreat leader. She's a student of Father Thomas Keating, whom I have interviewed, and several people I haven't and not familiar with, maybe she'll mention them during the interview, such as Bruno Barnhart and Beatrice Bruteau. And she also studied the Gurdjieff work for a number of years. Um, she's made her mark exploring wisdom Christianity and the often overlooked lineage of Christian non-duality. She is founding director of the Contemplative Society in Victoria, British Columbia and the Aspen Wisdom School. She now serves as one of the core faculty there together with Richard Rohr and James Finley uh, of the Center for Action and Contemplation in Albuquerque, New Mexico. When not teaching internationally, she resides in her seaside hermitage on Eagle Island, Maine, which is where she is right now. So welcome, Cynthia. Well, thank you, Rick. I'm glad we've got it up and running. <laughs> yeah, Cynthia and I really jumped through some hoops on both ends getting this thing going. We're starting about an hour later than we had intended because there are so many technical difficulties, but I think we've ironed them out, and I hope you'll enjoy this interview. I think you will. So um, for starters, I thought maybe it would be good to just have you tell us a little bit about yourself personally. I mean, just, you know, a little bit of a chronology in terms of you know your life as a younger as a young girl and when you first got interested in spirituality and that kind of thing well uh in the way i was born to it as a self-defense i was uh i was born just west of philadelphia mm -hmm. i grew up in a little town called westchester about an hour to the west and that's the part of the world that has very strong quaker heritage mm -hmm. And uh, my mother, at least, was a very, very devout practicing Christian scientist. Uh, and I was raised in that faith without any uh, its, ands, or buts. That was where we marched on Sunday morning. But they sent me, at least for elementary school, to Quaker meeting, where I had my first exposure to silence and where I... Uh, basically learned you know what was formed in me were the basic reference points for the contemplative life in these wonderful wonderful unprogrammed meetings for silent worship which were part of my early childhood life so it was wonderful it was bucolic out there we were on the edge of the the horse country that that opens into the amish country good soulful place back in the 50s when i was growing up so it was a life in nature, a life with the Quaker ambience, uh, a, a ready accessibility of, of divine uh, presence. And I struggled between really two competing maps of the universe, the one being furnished to me by my, my Christian science uh, Sunday school upbringing and the other by the kind of natural mysticism and intimate silence that I was knowing in Quaker meeting. So my, my life was a wonderful, wonderful sort of chance to sort of test these out. And uh, I guess what really jump-started my whole spiritual growth was when I, when I hit high school, uh, went, was sent to a wonderful private high school in Wilmington, Delaware, which was about 15 miles away. And we had compulsory religion classes there. It was, it was a non-denominational school, but they thought studying religion was part of every cultural human being's uh, duty. So we had a marvelous course the year I was, uh, I was a junior in high school on religious thought taught by a gifted man, again a Quaker, that exposed us to everything from Sartre to Paul Tillich. And it was in that, that course that the real spiritual questions of life began to come right to the fore. Sounds and like I you were a pretty given, serious young woman. You weren't just sort of like, 
indulging in everything the 60s had to offer. You were like, you know, th taking life pretty seriously and thoughtfully. Well, I was ahead of the curve then because the 60s hit when I was in grad school. Oh. <laughs> and so I was in the last drones of that kind of dying 1950s culture. And I felt like an alien for most of my childhood. Mm. Uh, so uh, I had to solve the things on my own. You, you shouldn't get the idea that I was uh, sober faced and studious. I was also uh, sneaking onto the baseball team and, and swimming and riding my bike all over the countryside. And uh, I just sort of you know, was opposed to the kind of culture that, that we grew up in where, where young women were supposed to be objects waiting to be invited to the prom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, I, I interrupted you there. Did I, uh, did I break your chain of thought or did you pretty much cover what you wanted to in terms of that phase? No, that's, that's fine. Okay. That's good. And then at some point you got married and had a couple of kids, a couple of daughters. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that was early on. Mm-hmm. And, and um, then, yeah, go ahead. That was a that was a great thing. I I uh, I did what would be nowadays completely illegal and frowned upon. I married my high school music teacher, huh. and uh, in those days it was quite legal. And we had a gifted, wonderful couple. You know, about a decade together. My daughters come out of that. He was a a brilliant, gentle soul. Mm -hmm. And the marriage fell apart by pretty much what you can expect when there's a twenty two-year age difference in it, yeah. but uh, we remain till the end of our life, to, to the end of his life, mine isn't over yet, uh, uh, very good friends, and I had the privilege of being with him just before his death, a uh, gifted, brilliant, gentle soul. That's great, and it's nice that you have such fond memories and appreciation. It doesn't always work out that way, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so then you... I don't know if this is skipping anything important, but then you got into the Gurdjieff work for quite a while. Yeah, that was fast forward, uh, you know, a few decades. In the in the process, I had gotten, uh, I'd solved my Quaker Christian Science standoff by uh, discovering Episcopalianism, mm. uh, and uh, was through was already ordained at that point and had been serving in parishes and uh, gravitating towards the monastic and mystical ends of it even then. But I got into the Gurdjieff work because uh, I became more and more intrigued and disturbed about why it was that Christianity, a religion who, you know, clearly has one of the most loving and inclusive gurus that's ever walked the face of the planet at its epicenter, should tend to develop itself in formats that were so rigid and exclusive and, uh, and you know, non-generous mm. and, and why didn't people walk the talk and that became more and more of a of a heartbreak to me and so it was through actually reading Jacob Needleman's uh, Lost Christianity in 1980 that the first pieces began to put together he he said at one point Telling people to wake up and be conscious is like telling stones to uh, pick themselves up, sprout wings, and fly to the sea. <laughs> that, that, that there's a missing piece, and until you can get that missing piece online, uh, you can't do the teachings of Jesus. And something in me said, bingo, that's it. Uh, yeah, I read in your book at one point that if, if one aspires to live the Beatitudes or any other gospel teaching, it is necessary to establish the level of consciousness from which they emerge. I think that's, exactly. the, that's the crux of it right there. Exactly. And that was actually, that's a direct quote or virtually a direct quote from Simeon, the new theologian mm -hmm. in the 11th century, uh, who was the first one to be on to the fact that, that, that the Jesus teachings emerged from a very high level of consciousness and that until you could basically run that program, uh, you were going to be constantly dumbing it down to a place where it made a, you know, a basically an inversion of itself. Mm. And, and I could see as those sort of ideas began to wash over me. And again, it was Jacob Needleman who first introduced me uh, to the thinking of, Jer of Simeon, the new theologian. Uh, so, so Needleman was on to the fact that it was something that was broken in the way we pay attention that kept our consciousness scrambled and low and distracted and not under our free uh, command. And it was this that wound up constantly making hash 
out of the uh, out of the gospel that Jesus was teaching. So it was when that pieces began to come together, and and then just at that time, a woman kind of almost casually tossed a copy of In Search of the Miraculous into the back of my car and said, oh, I saw the word miraculous and thought you'd be interested in it. Mm. Uh, so I don't know whether that was a setup or not. It had all the configurations of a setup, but I I read uh, and In Search of the Miraculous is the the classic access book even today to accessing the Gurdjieff work. So I read that, and it was like light bulbs left, right, and center. Mm. Um, before we get into that, I think it would be important to just establish a little main point from a thing we just covered, which is that. A teacher or anyone can only speak from their level of consciousness and a student or anyone else can only listen or hear from their level of consciousness which brings in the whole pearls before swine thing and you know the parable of the sower if you want to quote biblical references but um, you know there's there's always going to be a gulf and uh, and then once not only is there a gulf in the contemporaneously in the life of that teacher but then as time goes on and the thing gets passed on like a party game from one ear to the other over time it just gets more and more distorted and I think it's happened in every tradition exactly exactly and that's so right that you've seen that and you know even our understanding of what esoteric means they that nowadays people think esoteric means secret information that's withheld from people mm. which is ridiculous you know the esoteric dimension of every faith which is a very simple is hidden in plain sight yeah and nobody's hiding anything but until you reach a certain level of receptivity and nature reaches a certain level of broadcastivity, you miss, you just can't see it, you can't pick it up. Uh, my students even ask me when they go home, you know, but how am I going to tell this to my friends? How am I going to tell this to my husband? I, I say, don't even bother because uh, it won't be received. Uh, that That's a long bridge creating uh, a way that reception can actually happen. Yeah. And sometimes it's better to teach by example if you really want to convey something. Like in my case, after I began meditating, I wasn't really pushing my father into it or anything. But after a few months, he said, "Whatever you're doing, <laughs> I got to do yeah. it," you know, because you've yeah. changed so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. And that's why the other thing is that that in classic ways, paths made themselves a little bit hard to find. And certainly the Gurdjieff work did back in my days. It, it took me actually three day, three years of pretty hard seeking to get myself hooked up with a group. Mm -hmm. But one, one of the dimensions going on there is that they say that until a student has enough collected will and is able to sort out on their own and discriminate between, you know, a billion different things out there and the thing that really has their name on it mm. that they're not going to be able to appreciate they're not going to be fit for work anyway yeah. so you have to it's it's like a chicken picking its way out of the egg you have to do that work before you're ready to to be where the teaching is going to put you and how do you de develop that discrimination to know which of the and these days there's even a lot more to choose from than there was in the 60s but how do you you know how do you discriminate between all the various things and find the thing that's right for you well, you know, I'd have to pull the Christian rank and say it's a little bit of grace um, that uh, that Gurdjieff had a teaching about A and B influences, and he says most of us are out there in the world surrounded by A influences, where, which are all sort of competing things uh, making a play for our attention. And it's not until you can recognize something that's a B influence, which is a high, a qualitatively different taste for you. Mm -hmm. that that you can follow it and you got to get there yourself how that happens uh, a little luck a little management uh, I certainly think that meditation is a really good starting point because it it allows you to to filter out a lot of the garbage that's obviously just uh, playing at superficial parts of you yeah. and to, to listen from something qualitatively deeper well you but know I think a lot oh, of go it ahead. I'm yeah. sorry continue go ahead Oh, I was yeah, just going to say, you mentioned say, the word grace, and mm -hmm. I think that's, that's critical. Um, you know, there's that old seek and ye shall find. I, I think if you're sincere yeah. and if you really want this, whatever you define this to be, um, <laughs> but if you know there's something and you've got to find out what it is, then the very seeking kind of 
draws God's attention if we want to speak in terms of God and you know there's a there's a grace that guides you um, exactly yeah. yeah I think actually we have the direction wrong in the journey all along we we start from the impression that we are here and God's over there mm -hmm. and that we have to go towards God Oh, I love the fact we're on video. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas, I th and then if you can make enough noise and jump up loud and down loud enough, you'll attract God's attention. But I think rather it is always the opposite, that we are flowing out from the divine at any given moment as a particular path, as a kind of instantiation of divinity and form. And that what we we're always guided, and the path is always totally specific to ourself. What we have to learn is to simply stay in alignment with it, and that's what the learning about the B influences is all about. But it's it's easier to stay in alignment once you get the hang of it than not to stay in alignment with it and try on a billion different paths because they seem interesting. Yeah, I'd also suggest that God dwells in our heart of hearts and uh, cannot. I was once. I once heard someone say, "God may be omnipotent, but the one thing He can't do is remove Himself from your heart." And yeah. and so yeah. you know, even the subtlest impulse to reach God or to reach higher truth or anything like that, yeah, God hears it. You know, He, he yeah. you don't you don't yeah. have to shout. He's there. I'd venture that God is your heart of hearts. Exactly right. You know, and so that as you begin to listen, and it's basically just an issue of trying to paring away all the condition stuff, all the uh, what Thomas calls the false self agendas, all the all the static on the system, so that you listen from the truth the truth of your being. The old Latin word obedience really means ob audire, listen from the depth. Hmm. And as we learn to listen from the depth, then we then we hear and we align, and then the path becomes, uh, if not ever obvious, at least comfortable. Mm -hmm. Good. So um, I could sort of get you to talk more about the Gurdjieff thing at this point, but later in, in your book you talk about witnessing, and Gurdjieff, and th that brings up the Gurdjieff thing. And um, I'm wondering if we want to postpone discussion of Gurdjieff till that, or would you like to say something about it right now? Um, you're the master of this interview. You have a sense of the general flow. I, yeah. uh, you know, put a quarter in my mouth and I'll respond to any question. But, okay. Uh, well, however, however it unrolls. But, um, all right, let's talk about the Gurdjieff thing. What the heck? I already mm -hmm. dropped the bait. Um, so what were you actually doing as a student of Gurdjieff? Well, <laughs> I guess for me, I was spending most of my time sensing my feet. Uh-huh. And uh, that, uh, you know, I entered the I entered the group. It took a long run around. As I said, it was three years to get in of kind of I, I, I flunked the first hazing test, you know, that 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 as many people in the work would did at that point getting in. I showed up for an appointment. Oh, there must be a mistake. There's no Lord Pentland here. And because I didn't have the the patience and the foresight to wait, uh, I missed the chance. Missed but the I chance finally, to do what? To, what who's I Lord, missed the chance. What, what call it? What Lord Pentland was my my great missed opportunity. He was the he was the leader of the work in America for many many years, oh. and uh, I had managed to get to the point through Jacob Needleman of of having an interview arranged for him. This was back in 1983, mm -hmm. and the day I showed up at his office, I was told that there was no Lord Pentland there. Uh -huh. And then I I came back later, and there was a different secretary, and said she said there was a Lord Pentland there, but he wouldn't be in until four o'clock that afternoon. Could I wait? And I had train tickets back home, so I didn't. I see. Uh, it was the stupidest mistake in my life uh, because, as it turned out, he uh, he died two weeks later. Oh. And my, my journey towards finding the work was set back another two years. Mm -hmm. But by then, I managed to show up at the doorstep of Dr. William Welch, who was uh, one of the first generation magnificent old fellow uh, student of Gurdjieff was actually his attending physician in his last illness and I was admitted and uh, at their due deliberation about who I would work best with I was packed off to uh, a group in Halifax Nova Scotia which was actually closer to me in Maine than Boston uh, and there I worked but you know in terms of work 
Uh, and in terms of what are really the criteria, I was a kind of classic example of unbalanced uh, development. How so? Uh, brilliant mind, you know, I had done all the philosophy, I had a PhD, I'd, I hadn't published any books at that time, but it was like middle all the way. Uh -huh. And uh, and I'd never been taught any of the, the adab, as the Supis call it, of how you behave in a group. Uh, I was used to being the smartest student, and you put up your hand and you, you, you got into a debate with the teacher. Mm -hmm. Well, they weren't having that. They, mm -hmm. they observed that when I spoke in the meetings, which I did about six months too fast anyway, <laughs> that, uh, that I was always taking on the teacher. They said, you never ask a question. Mm -hmm. You talk in paragraphs. And then they took to, to cutting me off and saying, and where were your feet when you said that? Oh, I see. And over and over and over, it was this slow kind of allowing me to see that, that I was just hog tying myself because my journey, my, my vision of everything was being led, it lived entirely in my head. Hmm. And so it took a couple of years of really kind of, uh, Coming pretty close to, I wouldn't say it was breaking my spirit. I think the more snowflakes among us would say that I was handled unsensitively. <laughs> but but Dr. Welsh said that you know that one of the one of the responsibilities of an instructor is to absolutely accurately gauge the student's strength hmm. and push them right to the edge because that's where they're going to change. Uh, but if you push it too hard, you're going to break their spirit, and that will be counted as an eternal sin against you. Mm. Uh, so it was a, it's a teaching I've never forgotten when I've wound up in the teaching uh, seat myself, that, that you have to, particularly a strong-spirited student, you need to go at them. You can't let them get away with you know, all their enablings, because that's why they're there. They're there to change. But you better not let your stuff get in the way so that you get irritated with them and break them because that's uh, blood on your hands. Yeah. But little by little, they taught me. Little by little, I woke up and I, I finally, uh, a couple of people in the work who were senior leaders with very huge hearts uh, came to my rescue. And they, they stood beside me and while not letting me off the hook with, uh, with my kind of idiotic behavior, they helped me find a way to something else and to recognize something qualitatively different in me. And they, they never gave up on me. Right. And really to them, I owe my, they're my spiritual mama and daddy. And I, uh, I owe them a heart uh, that's boundless. So you, you mentioned being aware of your feet a lot. And I, I know what you were alluding to, I think. Um, I don't have a intimate knowledge with Gurdjieff's teaching, but as I understand it, it involves a, sort of a, a constant re, or intermittent remembrance of the self and, and uh, attentiveness to what you're actually doing. Um, and I've heard a criticism of it, which is that, um, you know, it can make your speech and behavior somewhat stunted or, or unnatural because you're dividing your attention between what you're doing and trying to remember the self. And the, the criticism I've heard is, and the, the, the elaboration of that is that the self is not something to be lived by a conscious, intentional remembrance throughout the day any more than cleanliness is achieved after your morning shower by remembering the shower. Um, mm -hmm. So how would you address those criticisms? Well, I would say that, that they're quite right that a certain misinterpretation and even misteaching of the work can wind you up that way. Mm -hmm. the, the important thing that that's often gets lost sight of is that Gurdjieff taught three-centered awareness. He said that there's a middle, there's the, the intellectual center, mm -hmm. which is actually the slowest of the three centers, but it's counterbalanced by an emotional center, which is not synonymous with the heart. It's sort of the the joint sympathetic resonance of the, uh, the neural system. And then there's a moving center, which is not the gut, but is really intelligence in motion. It's kind of the intelligence that allows you to ski down a hill or know how to put your feet when you're walking downstairs without watching each one of them mm -hmm. faster than the mind. And so the whole remembering your feet was really about uh, bringing your moving center online with its genius, which is sensation. 
and using attention to call sensation into your being, which brings you into the now. And the idea was that most of us in the West are living a mental, uh, uh, you know, reduction of ourselves. So, and and the work can be criticized in that way when you try to remember yourself with your with your intellectual center alone, you're never going to get it, mm-hmm. and you're going to do all those things, those stilted ways of thinking. And I've actually taken on some people in the work so to say that divided attention is the wrong word. We're not dividing our attention. I think that's a misteaching. We're expanding our attention out of a core center, which is somewhere around the solar plexus, so that it can gradually hold more and more in a unified field. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the early work teaching was having people essentially multitask using their mind. And, And when people understand that, they've got exactly what your friend is, uh, is complaining about. But yeah, that was, actually, is, that was actually Maharishi. Yeah. He said that when he first yeah. began teaching yeah. in England in the early 60s, people yeah. would come and they'd get up on the microphone and they, mm-hmm. would, they would say a word and pause and say another word yeah. and pause. And he said, why are you talking that way? <laughs> and they yeah. said, well, yeah. we've, we've been told to remember the self. And he said, well, no, no, no. The self isn't lived by this kind of mental gymnastics. It's much more. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly, but when you when you can fill up the body and the being with sensation, and the I am reverberates from that deepest core of your heart, it's different. Yeah. But but yeah, that drove me out of the work a lot because it's very very easily turns into this sort of stilted mental gymnastics. Right. And uh, I was I was actually running into that in certain corners of the work in my first way, and it was only my 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 work parents uh, who pulled me out of that. And the Gurdjieff movements, if you actually do them, are intended to help you get through that barrier of over-mentalizing the work. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the British folks, particularly, uh, didn't have movements right before them. A lot of the British groups uh, articulated themselves without that part in it. Mm -hmm. And if you lose that piece, the, the Gurdjieff work is, in my opinion, defenseless against becoming simply a, mi- a mental black hole. Yeah. Okay. Um, and since we're on this topic, um, let's just talk a little bit about witnessing for a minute. Um, there's, I think it's treated nicely in your book. A lot of times witnessing is discussed as something one should try to do in some intentional way. And I always counter that, no, it's something you are. In other words, there's a depth of silence that can become your, you know, your 24/7 reality, and when it does, mm-hmm. then naturally there's a sense that you are not in the doer, you're not engaged in action. Action is going on, but you reside in this silence. Would you concur with that, or would you actually advocate some sort of practice or intentional witnessing? Well, I, I think witnessing is really a gamut. Yeah, you said that. You, you know. Did. Yeah. And it goes from, on the one hand, it's it, it goes from just just counting to three before you react, mm-hmm. you know, towards towards being able. I think there's some elementary witnessing that goes on in all psychotherapy, as you can uh, detach enough from your life to look at it and see it. Uh, but where witnessing, and I think its companion piece, mindfulness, tend to get stuck in our culture is it's assumed to be a mental activity Mm -hmm. and and people when you ask them where's your witness they will point to sort of like in the back of their head uh i think that's totally wrong i think that what the what the eastern mystics of the of the western church the eastern orthodox discovered was that witnessing is what naturally happens when your mind is in your heart in other words when it's carried lower and it has nothing to do with I am watching myself have an angry reaction you know too slow you know uh, that that but it really is uh, it becomes progressively imprinted in one as you move beyond using the mental system to try to generate your identity because it just can't it it's beyond the capacities of that system yeah, here's a line from your book. Incidentally, when I say your book, I'm referring to this one, which I've been reading, The Heart of Centering Prayer. Um, yep, yep, you, I have it right here in case you need it. Uh, here it is, Dueling Books. <laughs> Dueling Books, <laughs> 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 um, You say, 
uh, it, that regarding witnessing, it does not need to be paid attention to because it itself is the subject of attention. I like that. Yeah. Um, so it's not because if it were something you had to pay attention to, then it's a thing, you know, and things come and go. But we're talking yeah. about the very subject of all attention, which is um, abiding, which is a continuum. It's it's not an object you can sort of try to keep in your awareness as you attend to other objects. Exactly, yeah. exactly, and that's uh, that's that's it. It's that overly mentalized understanding, and and that's what you were complaining about, or Maharishi was complaining about the people, the people in the Gurdjieff work. They were doing this mental witnessing. I am remembering myself. You can't do it from there. Yeah. It just doesn't work. It's, it, the best you can come up on is reflecting on your being, not coinciding with it. Mm. Did you ever hear that line from one of the Upanishads that says, two birds sit in the self-same tree, um, one eats of the sweet fruit of the tree and the other eats not, just sort of watches or observes. It's a, it's a beautiful little poetic description yeah. of witnessing. Yeah. It's lovely. Yeah. It's lovely. Jacob Burma has one very much like it. He says there are two eyes in the soul. He says one is focused on the outer world and the other one is always holding in God. Mm. You know. Nice. All right, maybe we should get on to centering prayer. Um, sure. Yeah. How did you first stumble upon that? Um, I first heard about it in 1987 when I was out at New Camaldoli, uh hermitage there, that, that fabled uh, Benedictine monastery perched above the Pacific Ocean. Mm. And uh, one of the women who was a sort of long-term resident in the community at that point had been reading Thomas Keating's Open Mind, Open Heart. And so I had a look at it and thought, hmm, this looks good, uh, you know, that an, an effort to sort of describe and, 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 uh, and develop a pattern of, of meditation based on Christian reference points. So I I took a look at the book and I, I played with it, read it, practiced it a little, and then, you know, sort of put it away and then got called back to it by a completely uh, sort of circuitous route. In 1989, Parabola magazine uh, contacted me that they were they were putting together a 25th anniversary issue. And they basically asked me, uh, do you know anybody, uh, anybody, any Christian you know, who we could put in an issue on non-duality with the Dalai Lama who wouldn't make a fool of himself? <laughs> so I said, well, uh, maybe Thomas Keating. I didn't really know Thomas Keating from Adam at that point. I just know he'd written a book on meditation. And I also knew he had a brief cameo appearance in, in Jacob Needleman's Lost Christianity. So they said, okay, good. Thomas, it is. You interview him. Mm -hmm. So I, I trooped out to Warwick, New York, where he was doing a weekend at the, the then uh, Centering Prayer, you know, center, ashram, you could call it, uh, the Center for Contemplative Living, did the interview. And in the part of the interview, he said, well, you should come to Snowmass and study it. Uh, so I signed up for a 10-day intensive, and so in, in May 1990, I met uh, Centering Prayer for the first time. Hmm. Okay. What's your understanding of how Centering Prayer originated? Well, I, you know, the, the same information that everybody else has, that, uh, that, that Thomas Keating, who was at that time uh, abbot of St. Saint, uh, Joseph's Monastery, about an hour outside of, of Boston, began to become noticed, increasingly noticed and increasingly distressed by the fact that, uh, that Westerners of essentially uh, Catholic background, Christian and usually Catholic Christian, were deserting the faith en masse uh, towards Eastern meditational practices. And Thomas had also been well aware and had already been working with the monks on realizing that that contemplation in the Christian community had just gotten rigidified and essentially non-existent. So he he went into a chapter meeting, a meeting of his monks one day, and offered them his famous challenge. Is it not possible to put the whole of the Christian contemplative tradition in an updated format that could be used by modern people in the world. Okay. What year was that, do you know? That was, um, oh, somewhere around 1974, 75. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, one of the monks in the community, Father William Menninger, uh, took him up on the challenge, went back to a classic of Christian, you know, the Western Christianity, an uh, anonymous book called The Cloud of Unknowing, and there found uh, in the middle of chapter seven, what became the essence of the method of centering prayer uh, that that says if you would have not a lot of words are needed in prayer but if you would have the whole of your aim your naked intent direct to god uh, put into a single word pick a short word of one syllable clasp it to you and and never let go of it and ride with it as your shield and buckler so that became the scriptural basis uh, for the beginning of centering prayer okay uh, there's a little bit of a backstory, if you don't mind my telling it. Um, mm -hmm. it fills in some interesting aspects of this story. So in, in the summer of 1971, um, Marji Mahesh Yogi came to the University of Massachusetts at Amherst for six weeks. And first he taught a one-month course, and then he taught a two-week symposium where Buckminster Fuller and Hans Selye and people like that came to speak. And I was there for the whole thing. Um, and several of the monks from St. Joseph's you know, came over. They said, let's check, check out what's going on here. And they ended up learning TM, and ultimately 80 of them ended up learning TM. Pretty much everybody at St. Joseph's was doing it. Um, and they were, this went on for a number of years, and they were happily meditating along. And several, several of them became what are called checkers, which is, involves memorizing about 30 pages worth of notes on the fine mechanics of, of meditation, so as to be able to correct somebody's practice if they begin to get off, off of it, uh, you know, and begin to get unnatural with it or something. And, you know, Basil Pennington came out here to Iowa to visit and so on. Uh, mm -hmm. Then, around 77 or 78, Marshi came out with what he called the TM Siddhi program, which was based on the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which purported to be able to teach people to levitate and things like that. And Father Keating was like, oh my God, <laughs> this, is going yeah. too, this is going too far. The TM movement's going to be destroyed by this. And I suspect that even prior to that, they were looking into, like, is there something like this in our own tradition? But I think at that point he decided to sever involvement with any TM-related thing and just let, let's just let's just do this in our own tradition and find the the source of it. And as you say, the cloud of unknowing has something that sounds remarkably similar in its mechanics. And so anyway, that that's kind of a little interesting story of the way it went. And I'm not saying that this was wrong. I'm not I'm not passing a value judgment. I think so many people have benefited from centering prayer who would never have been interested in TM. And, T and I'm not suggesting either that centering prayer is some alteration or bastardization or something of centering prayer. I'm, I'm sure it's totally legitimate in its own right. I'm just offering that as a little interesting aside and perhaps you and I can compare the mechanics of these types of meditation and other types of meditation as well in, in the course of this discussion. I'd be really interested in that and of course the early leadership in in, in Thomas's movement contemplative outreach uh, came very strongly out of the TM. Uh, Gus Reininger was a big TM uh, person. Mm -hmm. Tom Hall, who's on the board even today, came out from a TM background. Mm -hmm. uh, so TM was one of the major inputs for sure in the in the practice. And uh, as, as well as Thomas was getting sort of shouldered on the other side by, uh, by some uh, Buddhist roshis that he oh. introduced to the monastery, he had an intuitive sense. I, I, I mean, I've known Thomas now for 30 years or so. And he has an intuitive genius for the interspiritual dimension. It's mm -hmm. still as he's as he's uh, as he's now sort of midway through his 90s. It's emerging as the one great love of his life, the, the interspiritual understanding of non-duality. Mm -hmm. But even back when he was an abbot in the in the late 60s, early 70s, he sensed so keenly that the Christianity had gotten stuck and that it had become overly doctrinal and contentious and legalistic, and that this had something to do with its failure uh, to access what had once upon a time been accessed in Christianity under the rubric contemplation. Mm 
Hmm. And somehow that had to get kick-started again. Contemplation, by the time Thomas became abbot, had become sort of the eagle scout of the contemplative life. And it was such a high and mighty thing that nobody could do it. And if you felt you were called to it, it was a proof that you weren't ready for it because only pride could make you feel like you were called to it. Hmm. So it just wasn't happening. And people were stuck in their minds and there wasn't any going deeper. So he intuitively intuitively with this open, open spirit that he has reached out to what was available and he grabbed TM and he grabbed uh, the Roshis. He he was doing Cohen's, Cohen's study in St. Joseph's for years while this all came. He knew there was there was water in the well down there and he was going to find it. Yeah. Uh, I and I'd love to talk to you more about techniques because I've heard different stories, mm -hmm. but I know that one of the things that's happened to Thomas slowly over the course of his own teaching is to move centering prayer progressively away from being a mantric based practice um, to be away from being an awareness based practice to finally being what he calls a receptive practice, what I call a surrender practice, mm -hmm. and. I suspect there were some incremental notches in that, but he's uh, where he's where he's wound up with centering prayer to, for me today. I think the closest equivalent, as he's come to understand it, is actually is actually a Zug Chen. Uh -huh. But I know he didn't start out that way, and I'd be interested in seeing where he, what your piece of the backstory is about how he's moved that way. Well, there's some interesting and subtle distinctions here. Um, Pronu uh, correct my pronunciation, but you, at some point you talk about the cataphatic and the, what was the other one? Apophatic. Apophatic. I, I, I always chuckle when I hear cataphatic because we used to have a cataphatic, but she died. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she was kind of fat and got old. Um, but, um, and explain briefly what those are because this relates to what I want to say. Okay. This is old, old distinctions that have been around since the third or fourth century in Christian uh, spiritual theology. Cataphatic uh, is, is essentially prayer, meditation, practice that engages the faculties. Mm -hmm. Faculties are, you know, the, the Thomas Aquinas define them as our will, reason, memory, emotion. In other words, that prayer that works through the normal access routes of our mind. Apophatic, uh, in some sense, transcends those usual mental rational faculties and therefore is often described as the via negativia, the prayer of emptiness, the prayer of no form. Uh, I think that's a misunderstanding. I think it's it, it looks like no form from the basis of the cataphatic faculties, which are much more coarse. Uh, but it's it's a prayer that really engages the subtle, um, you know, higher noetic intellective capacities uh, of the of the of the of consciousness. Uh, so, so in that sense, uh, centering prayer is apophatic prayer. But you have to be careful with them because I think people don't understand the terms. They often think that that apophatic prayer means you're worshiping silence or you're worshiping emptiness. Um, it's it's not that. You're just switching to a more subtle operating system. Yeah. Now, when I heard you discuss those terms, one thing I in, inferred, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the cataphatic uh, is more of a, a willful doing intentional individual applying some kind of effort of, kind of thing whereas apophatic is more of a surrendering letting the divine intelligence letting natural tendencies run the show is that true or shoot or, yeah well i i would say that's probably a byproduct of okay it. i think that what happens is it's not so much the the direction of the action but the sense of where the self is located mm. uh, in cataphatic prayer, you're really operating out of what you I would call your your phenomenal usual sense of uh, of small selfhood. I am praying. I am acting. I am receiving bliss from God. Uh, I am surrendering. I am having visions. But it's still coming back to that finite self. Mm -hmm. In apophatic prayer, what makes it possible to step into that larger, more spacious self is that you're simultaneously stepping into a witnessing presence, mm. which is not doing, but being. 
in the way that you've talked about before. It's your 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 you're stepping into a fundamental different system for perceiving reality. And the finite self is not at the heart of it. And so it will appear then that it's surrendered. It will appear that it's uh, that it's uh, letting be. But I think this is because it's a self that, that isn't always holding on to its boundaries. Mm. And so things flow with much more uh, graciousness and give and take. So you could say that if meditation is going well, you might very well move from cataphatic to apophatic in the course of a single meditation, pretty much every time you do it. I think you have to. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're not, you're not meditating. Right. <laughs> At least you're using some of the cataphatic forms of meditation, like, you know, visualization is cataphatic meditation. Mm -hmm. uh, Petition is cataphatic meditation. Uh, there's a lot of forms of, uh, of, of it, and many, many forms of meditation and pathways will start in cataphatic and move towards apophatic. Okay. But at some point, when you move into, when you th sink into those deeper waters of the mind, uh, as the Buddhists like to say, you're moving into the realm of the apophatic. Okay, good. Um, for the reason I wanted to offer that little prelude, you, you mentioned uh, mantric meditation and vipassana and that kind of thing. And there's a real subtle distinction between um, f focusing on the breath or a mantra or something like that uh, as, as sort of an, something that is important that you should keep in your mind versus doing it in such a gentle, subtle way uh, that um, it's not really the the primary intention, really the primary intention is a surrender into silence and the the mantra or whatever just serves as a sort of a, a catalyst or an aid to that. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And it, it helps me that I've gotten conflicting reports about, you know, I never practiced TM myself. Mm -hmm. I started right from centering prayer. But some people say that in 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 TM the mantra is recited, you know, consistently as a touchstone for attention. The, you're given your mantra and you, you recite it. Others say, no, you only use it discreetly when you realize you're being pulled to a thought and that that's what Thomas Keating picked up from TM. So if you could clarify that for me, it would, sure. uh, well, it would first, help my own history. First, you start by just closing your eyes and doing nothing for half a minute, just letting yourself settle down. And then, you know, when, when, we close, when you close the eyes like that, naturally you do settle down, you feel some quietness, some silence, and then, um, you know, thoughts may be coming as they always do in life. And you, if you think about it, you know, you don't really make an effort to think thoughts. You, they, just, they just pop into the mind. Yeah. You don't try to articulate them clearly. You don't kind of persist in repeating them or keep on remembering. They just, they just come up as a gentle impulse and they go. Uh, so then, having settled into that silence, one begins to think the mantra as effortlessly as you think any other thought, which is to say, it's a faint idea, just subtle mm -hmm. impulse, and um, and you don't try to persist in repeating it or keep on remembering. It's just it's a subtle impulse, and immediately, it begins. Well, not immediately, but maybe immediately, it, it soon begins to become more refined, more subtle, more more delicate, more. And you're, what you're actually doing is kind of tracing a thought back to its source um, mm -hmm. automatically, not intentionally, not like, okay, where's this source? But just each repetition takes you to a sort of a subtler step, subtler step, subtler step, subtler step, and then the thing will just disappear at a certain point and you're left with pure awareness, no mantra, no thought. So that's a brief explanation. Yeah, yeah. great. That makes a lot of sense to me because yeah. Thomas had the devil of the time, you know, and I think it really plagued him for the whole 1980s to try and explain what was happening. Mm -hmm. You know, that, uh, and of course, you know, he got nailed for it several times because it sounds like, as he puts it out, that that you start out saying your sacred word. Mm -hmm. And then, as the way the early explanations used to go, when you realize you're no longer being attracted to thoughts, it's okay to let go of your sacred word. But of course, there's a catch-22 built right in there because how can you decide to let go of your sacred word without that being a thought? And yeah. So well, people nailed him at the start saying that he was teaching a mantric practice that shifted to an awareness practice and then shifted back to a mantric practice. Uh, and what he was trying to do is talk about this subtler 
subtler dimension of letting it uh, letting it fade. Mm -hmm. But there weren't really words that he could put together that, that conveyed that. Yeah. Well, there's a nice principle here, which is that the mind has a natural tendency to seek a field of greater happiness. And these subtler dimensions are more gratifying, they're more charming. And so if, if one can successfully begin to move in that direction, then it's just the, the mind is drawn effortlessly toward the greater charm. So there's, there's, if, there's no effort involved. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, also, well, I remember when I talked to Do Do Father Keating that um, he had a brilliant and clear explanation of the outward stroke of meditation as being the sort of natural sort of bubbling up of uh, impressions that had accumulated and that the, the sort of the deep inward stroke of meditation is conducive to the unwinding of those impressions and that as they unwind one begins to have thoughts and that that's what kind of brings you out um, and so there's nothing wrong with having thoughts it's just as natural as, as anything else but then once I don't, I don't mean to be talking so much here people um, hopefully excuse me for going on like this but um, you know how it is when you can have a thought and you don't even know you're having it for quite a while and then maybe after five minutes yeah. or two minutes or whatever, you realize, hey, yeah. I've been thinking a thought all this time. <laughs> yeah. 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 And so the reason for that is that the, the sort of the thought is intense enough um, be, that it totally grips the attention. It totally consumes the attention. There's not even room for a second thought, which is, oh, I'm having a thought. You're just absorbed yeah. in that thought. And yeah. until the impression that's causing the thought has dissipated to the point where the thought itself becomes sort of more diaphanous, and then you realize, oh, I'm off. And, and then that's time for another inward stroke. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've been working with that myself, you know. I was trying to add my own kind of contribution to, to sorting out the, the confusion around this subtle state from a different point of view. And I, I, I started with the idea that, that, that centering prayer needs to be grounded theologically in the whole motion of kenosis or letting go. Mm -hmm. Because people were people were, were you know upset about centering prayer and still are. Thomas takes a lot of cat flack because people say, oh, he's just teaching a Christianized TM, and uh, and that he's not teaching anything that Jesus taught. He's not teaching anything that will help you in Christian uh, practice. And so I, I realized it was going to be really important to get a, a a theological basis under that that was indigenously Christian, and realized that that what centering prayer is really looking at and concentrating on is the act of letting go of a thought, you know, and yeah. rather than trying to to describe the thing in terms of subtle attractions of more subtle thoughts or more subtle mm -hmm. states, to, to put it in terms of when you let go of something, when you break that subject-object attention, you're at least temporarily for a nanosecond tasting an objectless awareness. Mm -hmm. And that what really stabilizes the field of consciousness in those other states is being able to hold objectless awareness, which I see as an incremental learned skill that, that centering prayer teaches. So I went from, from putting the kenosis piece in, which I did in my first book on centering prayer, to then taking it through the cloud of unknowing to the attention piece and the cloud of unknowing's clear understanding that when the attention is in the configuration of focused on any object, no matter how holy, uh, your mind is uh, is essentially not in the heart. It's it's essentially uh, it's essentially caught in a form which is lower than contemplation. Mm -hmm. So, so my two contributions in the direction of this 20-year conundrum have been kenosis and objectless awareness. And I, I think Thomas is, is moving along a parallel track on those things as he's gradually, uh, as he's gradually learning to language, uh, talking about an attraction, a receptive attraction to more and more subtle states. Mm -hmm. But I think it's not so much a matter of attraction is a matter of graciously letting go of the of the attention in a certain configuration. Yeah, well you can't sort of uh, storm the gates of heaven, you know, I mean it has to be a letting go. As a matter of fact, I had yeah. an interesting experience in reading your book. Um, yeah, I've been meditating for over 49 years and yet it's like, 
It's like it can always be fine-tuned. You can always sort of, you know how when you're driving a car, you're always making these subtle adjustments to the steering wheel without even thinking about it. And, and, yeah. and you, you know, perhaps if you're not, perhaps you could drift off a little bit too much and you start hitting the rumble bars on the side of the road so you come back. Well, even after many years of meditation, it's, it's possible for sort of this subtle sort of um, effort or, or subtle unnaturalness or something to either creep into the practice or to have been there all along and you didn't realize it. Anyway, when I, when I started reading your book, it like shifted me to an even more innocent thing and this, this whole emphasis on just completely letting go and, and just resting in God. You, you had that nice quote from Father Keating about the, the nun who had said she had 10,000 thoughts in her meditation. He said, yeah. oh, beautiful 10,000 opportunities to return to God. So I don't know, it just had this subtle influence on me, which I really yeah. appreciated and, and um, actually made my meditation even better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. You know, I mean, so many of the problems we have with meditation or stiltedness entering anything are really only solved until that level of self-good can be seen and laughingly looked at. You know, as long as I'm meditating to improve my meditation, to have better periods, you know, any of that kind of stuff is going to wind up just kind of bending you over backwards. And, yeah. and it's like you could be beyond that, but there's no you left anymore. Yeah, I've actually uh, had people say to me that when they finally awoke to a somehow somewhat of an enlightened state, whatever state you want to call it, uh, mm -hmm. where the, the, where God was really in the driver's seat for the first time, it's like they and then they meditated. They felt like I've never never done this correctly. Now I'm doing it for the first time in my life, and maybe because yeah. I'm not doing it anymore. And this is the way it should be. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would say that I'm still a C plus meditator after all these years, but sometimes I sit down there and, you know, I'm not meditating anymore. I simply am entering a, uh, a state of total connected aliveness. Yeah. That, uh, and I said, where'd this come from? You know, this ought to be the fruit of being a good meditator. <laughs> yeah. And you, you know what you were saying a minute ago about, um, how did you phrase it, about sort of maintaining object -less, object less awareness or something yeah um i really think and like, like your comments on this that ultimately it's not something that there should be any that, that there would need to be any sort of intentionality to maintain it should become as yeah. as automatic as breathing um mm -hmm. like a great athlete who doesn't think okay now this is how i'm supposed to move my tennis racket you know but they just yeah. do it. it's so ingrained that it just is spontaneous exactly yeah exactly it's it, it's carried the other systems take over and it gets into the moving center and it gets into the emotional center and you you settle down and you do uh you do it yeah uh, that that i one of the wonderful things that happened to me when i was working with the book is i i got to uh Spend some time with a uh, with a with a neuro meditation guy at, at Scripps College, who's uh, a student of Thomas Keating's, mm -hmm. and uh, we were able to look at pictures of, of people meditating, of people doing centering prayer, of advanced Tibetan practitioners doing zogchen, and and we we saw that in the uh, the advanced meditators of the uh, you know in both both of those paths. That what you see neurologically is this drop, this drop into some, you know, that, that is simultaneously an activation of, of the hippocampus, deep memory. But there's this very clear, you know, it's not, there's no efforting, there's no will, there's no tuning up parietal lobes or anything. It's like, you know, mm -hmm. you fall into the all. Mm. And, uh, and, I feel that after years now, 30, 30 years or more of centering prayer being my practice, I certainly feel that as a, as a kinetic motion within me. Uh, what do you mean by that, kinetic motion? Well, you, you sit down on your cushion and boom, Oh, you're automatic, there. yeah, boom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm deeply, deeply embodied. Deeply embodied. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you probably yeah. also find that... Um, even when you're not on your cushion, even when you're running through a busy airport or something, there is a, a, a deep silence that's been established through all that meditation and um, automatically it's just there with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the meditation is a quick device to, to remind you of the isness that is. Yeah. You know. And since you mentioned the physiology, I would suggest that all these 30 odd years of practice has been, you know, 
transforming your neurophysiology, your brain. Um, there's plenty yeah. of research on that, that, you know, neuroplasticity. Sometimes people refer to meditation as brain sculpting, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> that yeah. uh, it really does change. Well, that certainly has been my understanding. I think you're basically uh, upgrading the operating system, uh, eventually uh, installing a whole different way of making connections. And it's only when you install that that human beings are are good for solving, you know, some of the problems that beset humanity, because the the device of separating, measuring, comparing brain that we normally use to figure our way around the planet uh, has outlived its survival value long since. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the 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 capacity to gradually develop holistic perception and and in the classic days of Christianity, contemplation didn't it it wasn't sunyata, it wasn't emptiness. That's been a modern spin on it. It was I uh, quote, knowledge impregnated with love. It was a kind of luminous knowing. Uh, a knowing from if you want to if you want to translate impregnated with love into more modern kind of quantum physics language, it's knowledge within the felt sense of the relational whole that you're a part of. Hmm. Uh, it's a deep, it's a deep sense of collected, holistic, impatterned knowing, and that is a has always been seen as a higher intellective capacity, a noetic capacity, not a uh, a listening to God in silence, not an emptiness path. Hmm. Uh, so, and I think we need to get that understanding back, because you you certainly have to turn off the brain that's thinking according to the old operating systems. Uh, that brain is just getting in the way. But I think the idea that apophatic prayer is contentless is a reductionism of our era. I think it's a mistake. I think there's a suddenly imprinted coherence that all the great mystics have acknowledged and are striving for, and which is really necessary in our own times. Yeah, if I understand you correctly, um, I think what you're saying is that when we enter into deep states, it's not just emptiness or nothingness, but there's a, we, we sort of dive into the home of all knowledge, we could say. I mean, there, there, exactly. there's, a, yeah, I mean, it's even said that the whole, the Vedas, and I, I think this may be true of mm -hmm. the Ju Jewish uh, tradition too, but that they were not written or anything they were cognized that they actually exist in some kind of deep deep you know fundamental level of creation and that uh, those who were able to do so were actually discovered them there and then just spoke them out uh, but yeah 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 that all makes sense to me i mean you you enter into a foundational you know causal ground mm -hmm. through which through which the patterns are continuously replicating your, themselves yeah. and it, it's not a matter of content you can't come out of that with any sort of thing you know that you didn't know before uh, that that what you need to know will be given to you in a moment in a situation uh, but uh, but it is a matter of hanging out at a wellspring and just sort of understanding that that your own mind and your conscious perceptive system uh, is part of, is not separate from or different from a greater comp comprehension, a greater coherent field. Mm. And, uh, and just to sort of become aware of that is to send you out back into the world with a deeper sense of, uh, of connectedness to the stream you're flowing from. Yeah. I don't know if I would agree that you don't come out of you, you won't come out of there with something you didn't know before because I think that you know Mozart and Einstein and many great people have felt that they didn't sort of dream up their creation they just kind of cognized it and then just you know wrote it down or, or thought you know expressed it in in some form I, I think that deep inspiration and insight and, and wisdom can often be mined you know if in, in that interior state. Uh, and, yeah. 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 I mean, it's it certainly is correct that products emerge from them, but they're they're no longer your products. I mean, that it, just as you've said, Mozart didn't say, "Oh, I've just gotten this wonderful idea from hanging out in the Akashic, Akashic records." I think <laughs> I'll, you know, uh, it was more like it just 
flows through you in the moment. Yeah, exactly. You and, become like a scribe or, or something of some deeper wisdom. Yeah, yeah, it is, and it isn't even a channeling thing because it, 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 it there's part of you that shuts up, and there's another part of you. It flows through your own particularity. I mean, Mozart wouldn't have sounded like Mozart if it had been Beethoven. Right. But, uh, but, uh, but it's. It's effortless, and I would say it's always situational. I mean, the whole idea of you getting visions, I mean, visions happen sometimes, uh, but I'm much more interested in the, the, the visions that happen on location as you're suddenly at a place and you understand that, uh, well, back to the very first conversation we had, you can't push the student any further than this or you're going to destroy her. Mm -hmm. And you just see that, and you don't know how you see it. but. But you see that you see from some place that you can't usually see from. That's the kind of practical vision, visionary skill that I'm much inter interested in. Yeah. And something that's been in the back of my mind that you mentioned earlier that this current conversation reminds me of is just the the idea that you know you mentioned how you were kind of turned off to Christianity originally because it seemed so rigid and doctrinaire yeah. and you know stifling and so on. Um, it's like I would say that this has been a problem with every religion, that, and that there's a, there's an inner core to every religion that pro, that its founder was likely living as a you know daily reality, and that over time that that core is lost, that that deeper dimension is lost, and so the religion becomes like a dead body without the spirit which yeah. animates a live body, and uh, so there's nothing necessarily wrong with the outer forms of religion but it, without their foundation in inner experience they become calcified and problematic exactly. in so many ways exactly and 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 i think thomas keating very very correctly intuited that that meditation or con contemplation was the sap was the flowing fluid that would would uh, would restore the body of christianity out of its calcification and back to life and i think he's 100% correct in that yeah uh, and uh, and that the practice really just opens up uh, capacities to comprehend the gospel, which is a non-dual teaching, in a non-dual way, right. and without it, you don't have a prayer. Right. So his his sense that that somehow we had made this so high and so mighty that nobody was doing it was just absolutely locking Christianity at its lowest level of expression, mm. and that this, you know, and every religious tradition will have a lowest low level of expression it's always going to happen but when you have only your lowest level of expression you don't have a living religion anymore yeah you know how it is that when people kind of get onto a spiritual practice and really begin to make some progress they begin to see realize not only the truth of their own religion if they have one uh, they, they begin it begins to make sense to them for the first time but they begin to look at other religions and say oh yeah they were saying the same thing just in a, a slightly different way in a different culture and so on Exactly. Uh, yeah. Exactly. And until that happens, you know, I think that really you have to break through to the place where you see that every religious path, all the great sacred traditions are are absolutely precious and, and necessary and irreplaceable like colors in the rainbow. Uh, if you lost one of them, the, the, the ability to understand what's in the invisible light spectrum of God would be diminished. Mm. Uh, so that, and I've also found for a lot of people that they will leave Christianity, for example, just, you know, just because it's still for many of us our religion of upbringing, leave with a lot of wounds, go to another path, embrace it, and become very, very adept at that path. Mm -hmm. But you find that until they can come back and heal the wounds that they've had in their religion of origin, it's going to limit their progress on the path they've they've chosen. Mm. They always hit a stuck place that's not going to be resolved within that path. It's going to be resolved by going back to where the issue was in their uh, in their Christianity, working through that so they're genuinely forgiving of the hurt that happens and then they're liberated they can be a buddhist or a sufi again but the rigidity always enters at the same level yeah yeah they can be a hindu <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and and, and where, where the jew is still aching there will be something off in the perfect hindu expression yeah you know it occurred to me as you were speaking that um just as father keating and his associates uh, 
discovered centering prayer in their own tradition uh, as a very effective technique for um, unfolding the, the, the experiential dimension that the religion's words had been referring to. There may okay. be some such thing in every religion if it could be found. I mean, Islam and, and uh, well, Hinduism has a lot of more pretty active already and so does Buddhism, but uh, Judaism and, the, the, you know, every religion must have these sort of hidden keys if they can only be exhumed and, and properly understood. Yeah, exactly. And along with the Gurdjieff work, that another of the very great gifts that came to me in my in my practice of Christianity uh, has been time spent seriously working with uh, with some uh, Rafai Sufis, mm -hmm. uh, mostly in British Columbia. Uh, but to have the to have the touch of that whole wonderful Sufi presence, which which. I think took the transmission of the living heart of Christ and kept it alive in in almost more pure form than any other place without ever acknowledging it as Christ or any of that. Uh, it just it was able to open for me and really engage the emotional center in a way that had never happened before. Hmm. So uh, so again, I've I've seen many times how the the great traditions bootstrap each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and realize that they have to pull each other up because we're all, you know, we're all needed. Either we're all needed or none of us are needed. <laughs> we sink or swim together. Yeah. And you know what I often do is when I think along these lines is I think of the fact that, you know, according to NASA with the Kepler telescope and so on, there, there are probably as many Earth-like planets in the universe as there are grains of sand in the Earth um, that it's rather small to just think of the religions that we know about. I mean, I think that there are probably trillions of religions <laughs> throughout the yeah. universe, all of them referring basically to the same thing, whether they know it or not. And, yeah. you know, all of them potentially viable paths to that, you know, inner reality. Yeah, I think so. That keeps you humble as you gaze at the stars. It does. That's uh, yeah. my screensaver on my computer is always pictures of galaxies, keeps things in perspective. Um, I'm going to take a little interlude here and ask a few questions that people have sent in, and then I have plenty more I want to talk okay. about. And, and from your side, um, you know, if anything comes to mind, just as I'm doing as we speak, if mm -hmm. anything comes to mind that I'm not thinking of to ask, you just pop it out, you know, and we'll get into okay, it. Okay, sure. So here's a few questions. Um, so we were just talking about Hinduism and stuff. Uh, a fellow named David Laws from Hampshire, England wants to know, what do you make of the evidence for reincarnation and cases of people seeming to remember people in this life from past lives? Well, you know, I would have to say it's uh, it's never been useful to my own work. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I know that there is, uh, you know, that, that some of the early Christians uh, seem to, origin in particular, seem to be very attracted to this. One of the reasons it hasn't been been useful to me is because I think that in the West we tend to get it in uh, in dumb loud, dumbed down versions but the eye that continues to be born the eye that remembers something the eye that uh, always seems to me like a more finite eye it's like I just keep having serial lives uh, and uh, my sense is that we get this one shot in this form and that the continuation, which is clear, uh, goes on in other forms and other dimensions. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that the idea of reincarnation is probably a necessary bookend to karma. Uh, but that if you, you can cut through the whole thing and, and I, and you know, it's it's. I'm not going to say that the that the teachings about coming back and finding the Tulku Karmapa are not true. Uh, that I think that we uh, we live these things into reality in the fields that we live in, and I think in a Buddhist reality, reincarnation has a very very different flavor to it than it does in a Western reality. Mm. But for my my work, I found that it's much more useful to think about that that. I'm out of this finite form when I'm out of it, and that that what has uh, has retained any kind of viable solidity in another dimension will 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 either do that or not do it. If it doesn't, you know, I'm dissolved back into primitive elements again. Uh, if something sustains, it sustains. But 
I don't think there's any need for continuance, uh, certainly not my continuance. I, I realized one day walking up a path, I'd sort of popped into my head, oh, I could disappear and God and the cosmos would still be fine. Mm -hmm. I thought, what a what a relief. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I would say I basically pass on that question. I, I'm like I'm certainly in no basis to, to to judge whether I in any august way deem it true or false. It just hasn't been one of the, the principles I find useful to work with. Okay, sure, fair enough. Um, I would add that you know, whatever the reality of the universe may be, um, it's not and dependent upon us for its existence and you know there isn't like buddhist reality and hindu reality and you know yeah. any any more than there's buddhist gravity and hindu gravity um yeah. the universe probably works the way it works um <laughs> and um if there's but I think if, we there's, do if there's reincarnation there is if there isn't there isn't I, i'm not yeah, sure we get yeah. to choose yeah well i think we we call into being as societies you know Sheldrake called them morphogenetic fields, mm -hmm. but when you have a group of people uh, really poised around and feeding energy into and drawing meaning from a practice, it does live it into existence a little bit. Mm. At least I it mean, makes it more but, real for them or more vivid in their awareness. Yeah, and I don't think this is entirely just subjectivity. I mean, there's a there's a Eucharistic reality that, uh, you know, for the for the believing Christians in a sphere, uh, Christ does literally become, um, you know, uh, present in the body and the bread. And when you're in a sphere where nobody thinks that way and they think it's great, easy, you're totemistic, um, you know, it doesn't come through with that kind of clout. Mm. So I, I think that there is a feedback loop between, you know, call it funky, funky Heisenberg, but that where the, where the, uh, where the perceiver is coming from is part of the dimension of the field. Explain that last sentence. Well, that uh, that the that the deep beliefs that we create, even if they are totally false and dangerous, become part of lived reality. I mean, uh -huh. to take it to to take it to a perhaps political and dangerous extreme now. We've seen such a rise in this country of racism and bigotry uh, just in the past, you know, few months, because the thing is out there. It's become what Valentine Tomberg called an egregore. It, it begins to have psychic critical mass, and then it easily downloads as forms in people's minds. And the more they're into it, the more they live it into existence. So, so I think there's a need to be responsible and responsive to the to the thought form climates in which you live, mm. uh, realizing that there there may not be such a thing as a universal objective scientific Newtonian truth, which is applicable everywhere. And, you know, and I think that that the that when I was in Bhutan and spent some time with Bhutanese Buddhism, the configurations, the the angry deities, the the all of that sort of stuff that doesn't have much meaning. Uh, in my Western world, hmm. uh, had a felt sense of depth and coherence because it was on location. And I think we do need to factor in the particularity of each stream. I think I see what you mean. So it's like if enough people are th believing a thing or thinking along certain lines, it, it sort of gives it a, a, a bit of a, some kind of a reality. Like in Ghostbusters, yeah. you know, the, towards yeah. the end when they were up on the top of that building and they they said, you know, don't think of your worst fear or whatever it was. And then one of them yeah. thought of the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man and he came marching along. He kind of gave yeah. it gave yeah. it form. <laughs> yeah, we can. we got to be careful about our thought forms and what we call into existence and what we work with. Because we can, whether or not something is true, it can be real. Good you point. Know. But I would also say that... The, well, it's real to a point. I mean, it's it's rel yeah. relatively real. It's a, it's a sort of a manifestation or a fabrication of collective consciousness. But I, I would I would posit that there are deeper truths that are beyond the whims of human understanding and and belief and attention. That sort of you know more. There, there's an old saying that which is closest to truth lasts longest. So yeah. and I'm sure there's something in Plato or, or whatever about this. But that that 
when you really get down to the bedrock of reality, there, there are certain fundamental laws of nature that are immutable uh, and that are not subservient to our understanding or whims. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, on the other hand, I could take it because our, uh, our fascism and hostility uh, could wind up blowing up the planet. Of course, and, yeah. Uh, you know, so that there is a certain, there is a certain uh, importance in being careful, careful with the sort of uh, transient realities we create. Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree. I don't think yeah. the two points we're yeah. making are, are contradictory. Yeah, are different. Yeah, no. I don't either. Okay, good. Well, I think we've beat that one to death. Um, yeah. <laughs> and any of these things, if, pe if people find this thought-provoking and want to pop a question in, go to the upcoming interviews page on BatGap, and there's a form at the bottom of the page. Um, here's a question from a Julie Hanzi who wants to know, does Cynthia believe that breathing and practices to open the heart help prepare the body for the experience of being aware of the divine's indwelling? Yes and no. I mean, uh, I think that embodiment is really, really important. I mean, I think embodiment was the neglected piece of the, particularly the Christian tradition for many, 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 uh, multi, you know, many, many centuries. And so I would say that embodiment is good. But I, I'm a little bit reluctant about this preparing the way for the thing it because it already sets it up on the I am doing this I am getting better there is a goal I'm going to get there and the point is that the divine intimacy can come screeching in out of anywhere and all of a sudden you're you know you're coffee logged you're sleep deprived you're in the middle of a, of a freeway in a traffic jam you're late for your appointment and boom all of a sudden for some reason you have no idea where it came from you're in the heart of the divine intimacy. So that I think it's really important to take our practices as fruits and gratitude of the oneness, as, as, as avenues of expressing uh, uh, our joy of participation rather than a means of acquiring something or making it better. Mm. But can't we create the conditions that are more conducive to um a deep practice. For instance, if you've been up all night, you know, partying and and you know, drinking or whatever, and in the morning you, you have a couple of cups of coffee to wake yourself up, and then you sit down to do centering prayer, it's not going to go as well <laughs> as if you had, you know, taken better care of your body. So, I mean, all these practices of yoga and this and that aren't they meant to sort of re just culture the physiology to to give us a, a bit more of an advantage in terms of clarity of experience? Well, I would disagree with that, and I've been incorrect, politically incorrect for years. Uh -huh. But I've often, I've often had friends who I, I, we were sitting down to meditate one day with some dear friends of mine in Toronto, and just as we were sitting down, the uh, the phone rang, and it was an angry person wanting where the electrical bill was, mm -hmm. and threatening to disconnect. And he hung up the phone in a fury, and I said, I thought we were meditating. He says, How can you expect me to meditate now? Wait till I calm down. Mm -hmm. uh, but the idea of trying to start by physically inducing a calm state or a deep state or a preferred state and then meditating is, I think, a backwards understanding of meditation. And it's a very powerful and common one. And it may be that TM and uh, the yoga movement have contributed to it. But we tend to think that meditation is about optimal states. And I, I don't think it has anything to do with optimal states. I think it has to do with with the instant, timeless, uh, causal uh, connection of consciousness to consciousness. And uh, I, I not only believe, but have experienced it many times that it's 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 often when you're in the quote quote worse states that that meditation becomes the most powerful, the most fully contrasting because it doesn't operate at the level so that it's uh, it's manipulable by outer factors. Mm -hmm. What you can increase is your subjective experience of having what you have pre-identified as an optimal experience. I think it's a trap. And uh, I'm with A.H. Almas here. He's got in his wonderful, wonderful book, uh, Runaway Realization. 
he names this trap so clearly that we use our embodied practices in order to acquire what we think are better meditation experiences, deeper states, profounder, that we think are closer to God. Uh, and he says that's backwards, and I agree with him. I think that the the realization of our undivisible oneness is instantaneous and timeless. And it's out of that that we that we get motivated to take care of our bodies and embody our bodies uh, so that there can be a fullness, a fuller, more, more rich presence in how we carry that instantaneous oneness out, how we embody it, how we connect. Yeah. So I, I find that the practices are the fruits of oneness and not the means to it. I agree with you, and I can still play the devil's advocate, even though I'm agreeing with you. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I'm reminded of Jerry Seinfeld, who's been meditating for decades, and, and he said one time that he, he would have continued, he got kind of burned out and stopped doing the Seinfeld show, and a friend of his said, well, you meditate, don't you? And he said, yeah, in the afternoon, and he said, oh, you should do it in the morning, too. And he said, why? I've just slept all night. I don't feel the need to do it in the morning. He said, do it in the morning. It'll set you up for a better day. And, uh, and he said... But the thing is, in the afternoon, he felt the contrast. You mentioned contrast because he was tired, he mm -hmm. was doing stuff all day. So sometimes when you're tired or things have been crazy, you the, the contrast can seem, um, you know, like you're, it's giving is giving rise to a more profound experience. Um, and I'll also acknowledge that having a, any kind of experience is really not the purpose of meditation. Like Father Keating says, you'll you'll understand the you'll know the benefits of it from how it goes in activity, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the fruits in life. Yeah, exactly. But you do devote a whole chapter in your book to um, neurophysiology, and um, and we've talked about how this is a long-term process of restructuring the functioning of the neurophysiology. So I would say, in response to Julie's question, that anything, even like diet and exercise and anything else which is conducive to a healthier body, healthier physiology will be conducive to the improvement of everything, whether meditation or your health or yeah. your, your relationships or anything else. This is the instrument through which we do everything. Exactly, yeah. So try to be sane, try to be respectful, and try to be grateful of it. And uh, But uh, but don't be afraid because because meditation isn't delicate and these, these, these subtle states, although they're subtle, are not delicate. Yeah. Uh, and they're they're strong. They're lions. Well, I definitely have seen meditators, including long-term meditators, get really weird, model molly coddling themselves, and just getting yeah. really fussy about you know everything, what what they eat, how they dress, uh, you know, and and just you know, I don't know, just getting off balance. So I mean, yeah. you know, there's, yeah, anything can be taken to extremes. Exactly. When fear enters in, uh, it's a distortion. Mm -hmm. And the fear that if I don't meditate, if I don't eat right, if I don't, you know, if I, then I will have less. I mean, when you, when whatever pushes you into a scarcity uh, mentality is going to be going in the, it's going to introduce one of those subtle distortions, I think. Yeah. And that, uh, and that sometimes I just blow it out for the fun of it just because, uh, because I think life is a forgiving partner and an exuberant partner, mm -hmm. and that uh, and that that our practice really needs to be allowing us to live life more exuberantly, not with more and more uh, guarded measuredness. Yeah, yeah. So certainly meditate, but then plunge into activity. Don't be afraid of it. Um, yeah, you know, enjoy yeah. life to the fullest, two hundred percent. Exactly. A exactly. question came in from a Susan in New York who says, who, what is Jesus? Just now Cynthia mentioned the living heart of Christ. Could you ask her to explain what that means to her? Yeah, well, there's a simple little question. <laughs> uh, I think what I'd like to do is to give a sort of descriptive world description of it. Uh, that I, I think Jesus is one of our great human treasures. Mm -hmm that he's one of the uh, 
one of the great messengers that seems to have been sent to the cosmos uh, from all the in all the great religious paths uh, to prod us along to open up new horizons of consciousness and new standards of behavior, new visions of possibility. And Jesus is one of the great ones. I think his his particular message that he that he took on cosmically was to model uh, and teach non-dual consciousness in the West for the first time. Mm -hmm. the, the vision of uh, the vision of the world if it was lived out of an undivided, clear heart. And he brought that, he taught that. It was happening in other parts of the world. There's a, there's a lot of energy, there's a lot of conversation between Jesus and Mahayana Buddhism. I mean, because these movements don't just compete, they all flow across the the planet in great waves. But I find that that, that is a, a comprehensive and safe and comfortable way of talking about the great ones that gets us out of the usual theological things that Christians wind up in is, is he the only son of God? Well, you can hear the dualistic thinking in that. You can hear how you know, the very thing that sent me screaming from Christianity, the need to, to control a non-dual gift with all these dualistic categories. Mm. But he's a great teacher. He's a first order guru, and whether you think he's the only one that was ever the divine son of God or not, uh, the one thing that is true is that first order gurus don't disappear from the planet. The, the, that they're the, always gurus, there. Order gurus first you? order. First, first order, order, I see, yeah. The highest ones, right. and he's, he's definitely those, which means that his presence is accessible here and now. Mm -hmm. I mean, and a lot of Christians have gotten very deluded about, well, he's gone and he'll be back at the end of time. Mm. But every time he enters your life, which can be constantly, it's the end of time. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, uh, gotcha. So he, he's, a, he's an infinite and still configured personal presence, uh, tending, uh, shepherding, aiding, uh, illumining, and drawing the planet forward. Mm. Uh, in my, in my understanding, in my, you know, in my trying uh, to, to extend this, he would not be the only one because this limits the vastness of the imagination of the divine. But he's the one that most immediately impacts on my sphere of existence. I see him as operating in, in deep solitarity and unitive love uh, with other great teachers, both on this planet and no doubt on other planets, uh, to, to aid in the perfecting of consciousness yeah. towards its divine capacity. Yeah, when somebody tries to tell me the only son of God thing, I, I tend to start talking astronomy with them and bring out that kind of a point about the number of Earth-like planets in the universe. And then I say, okay, well, if the only son of God, then is he kind of on tour the way Santa Claus is on New Year's, on Christmas Eve, where he has to hit all these households in a short period of time? Yeah. And, and if so, I mean, and if the world is only, if the universe is only 6,000 years old, then we've really got a problem because he's got to cover a lot of ground and he couldn't possibly stay on every planet for 33 years. But they usually hang up the phone once I get to that point. Exactly. <laughs> it's, the, it's the problem with doing the, the, the limitless, boundless nature of non-dual love with the mind because we wind up making a fool of ourselves because the categories we're wired to think in can't handle the immensity of it. Yeah. So we haven't talked, we haven't talked a lot, a lot about a lot of things here that we could get into, but um, obviously non-duality is a hot term these days. There's the Science and Non-Duality Conference, which you and I are going to in a couple of weeks, and everybody's writing books about non-duality. So, um, and I, I understand, well, let's let's have your take on non-duality, and maybe you could also allude to what um, Father Keating and Richard Rohr and people like that uh, understand it to mean. Well, I think the problem is when you throw this term into Christianity, you're dealing with a term that just didn't exist in Christian uh, self-consciousness for um, more than the last 50 years. It was just never a category that uh, that that. Christians or the Western Christians used to compute reality. Mm. So when the term I was brought in, well, they wouldn't call that non-duality. Oh, I mean, well, Jesus, I'm, I'm not saying. <laughs> yeah, in his they, experience. I mean, I, the experience exists, yeah. but it was never language that way. Okay. You would not, you would not have that 
explained in a theology class as non-duality, you would have it. You would have have it uh, explained as uh, homeo, the homeousis or the consubstantial nature of father and son. They didn't use the categories uh, because the West was never given to thinking about things in levels of consciousness. Uh -huh. That map, the kind of map we're all used to, the Ken Wilber map, the spiral dynamics map, uh, never really existed in the West. They, they thought in terms of degrees of oneness uh, of affective union, how close can you get? It was much more like a lovemaking model than it was a, uh, a levels of consciousness level. So when the term began to be popular in the great inner spiritual dialogues of the late 20th century, people started scrambling to figure out what it means. And I don't know any two Christians that have the same idea of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that that, as I say, Richard, for Richard Rohr, who I think has the simplest and most straight up and easily accessible version of it, uh, it's the opposite of duality. And what duality is, is polarized thinking, is either or thinking, this and not this thinking. And so for Richard, uh, non-duality really begins in and is largely about paradox tolerance and process tolerance. Mm that you can live with things in the messiness of becoming, that you don't have to be pushed towards one extreme or another. So there are definitely advanced categories of, of psyche, but I'm not sure it would qualify for non-dual consciousness the way Ken Wilber's using the term. Uh, I'm not sure it wouldn't. But, uh, and Many people try to see uh, non-duality or unity or unity consciousness as somehow equivalent to the highest state in the classic Christian roadmaps, which was the unitive state, the state of being one with God. But I, I think that's more of a way of extending a comparison because, the, again, the, the Western tradition is not filtering or is not measuring for levels of consciousness. Uh, my, my way of using the term is perhaps uh, unique uh, to my own looking at it, but I think you have to start looking at the operating system that's running and how it's setting up the perceptual field. Uh, and dualistic consciousness runs the program of, of identity through differentiation. It's a core principle of logic. It's a core, I am me because I'm different from you. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, and that non-dual perception doesn't structure reality that way. It, it grasps a pattern. It, it sees the mandala in all its wholeness. And that doesn't mean that it cancels out the, the individual parts. A lot of people confuse non-duality with monism, with it's all one. Uh, but it's a oneness that admits for great particularity, great great etching in of individual bits and pieces that are objectively different. You know, they're not the same, but it's not losing track of the sonority of the whole texture. Uh, it's like being able as a symphony conductor to hear all 83 different instruments playing different parts and to know that each part is doing its own bit and at the same time to hear and not lose track of the whole that they're all a part of. Mm. So it's a Teilhard de Chardin once famously said, it's a, uh, it's a paroxysm of harmonized complexity. Uh, yeah. so, uh, so we have many, many different unclarities, uh, and I think it's going to take a long time uh, before the, the Christian uh, you know, uh, niche really comes to any sort of consensus of what we're talking about, about non-duality and uh, how we even recognize it, much less how we train for it. Hmm. Well, you said earlier um, that uh, in your heart of hearts, you are God. And if we think of, if we understand God to be omnipresent, uh, and I think that there's actually evidence for that if we want to look at it, that we, anything we look at closely, we see that amazing intelligence functioning, then um, if God is omnipresent, the then can there be anything other than God? Uh, and if there is anything other than God, then he can't be omnipresent. There's, there's something that's separate and discrete from, from that ocean of intelligence. And if that's the, the way things are, things are, that's the way it is, then 
that allows for all the diversity and complexity and so on that you were just mentioning, uh, w w while at the same time containing all that diversity within a unified wholeness. And I think the whole notion is that one that that unified wholeness can become a living reality, thus kind of reconciling uh, the paradox and ambiguity that Richard Rohr talks about. In fact, Nisargadatta exactly. said that use those same two words. He said, "Spiritual maturity is the capacity to appreciate paradox and ambiguity." Exactly, exactly. And of course, you know, one of the most valuable tools that has come to us from Ken Wilber and his many, many valuable tools is his articulation of what he calls the line level differentiation mm -hmm. that we tend to uh, then that we tend to mix up the level of consciousness in a religion or the level at which is the, the, the truth is being articulated with a whole kind of theology of the religion. Good point. And and that Christianity uh, has often been castigated as being a dualistic religion because most of its theology has been articulated at a dualistic level mm -hmm. in which God is perceived to be other and we're taught that we are creatures and we are not God which means presumably there's a place where I stop and God begins and vice versa. We're still taught to to quake in our boots when the word pantheism is mentioned. Uh, and so Christianity is largely playing out and articulating itself in dualistic spheres. So people say it's a dualistic religion. But I think this is not the case. Uh, but And I think that it maintains a very, very subtle teaching at the non-dual level, but that to access that teaching requires you to move beyond not only the theology but the sort of perceptual mechanisms that people are doing are using to reinforce the level that's the dominant level and whenever whenever you start to do that you just trigger the alarms of of people that are working at a different level mm -hmm. i mean thomas keating has been so castigated by the evangelical fundamentalist arm of Christianity. They say he's teaching Buddhism. They're teaching, they say he's teaching, you know, new age, you know, but he's not. He's teaching the non-dual level of Christianity, but they can't hear it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Christianity is not a monolith. The, the, the Christianity of Billy Graham or Oral Roberts is not the Christianity of um, you know, Teresa of Avila or St. John of the Cross. And <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and I mean, referring to those latter two, um, wouldn't you say that if you really understood their experience and teaching, um, you do find non-duality? Yeah. I, I haven't studied them carefully. Oh, yeah. But yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It just hasn't, it so. just hasn't reached the mainstream of Christianity. Exactly, right. exactly. That, that in all the mystics, you will find that there's a deep apprehension of what would very, very, very clearly be cleared, you know, that that Jim Marion set the easy benchmark when he when he said Jesus is non-dual because he sees no separation between himself and God and he sees no separation between self and neighbor. Well, I think any of the mystics would would have the same experiences. That's yeah. non-dual Christianity. And I think Jesus would rather have a beer or maybe a wine, as the case may be, with <laughs> with St. Teresa <laughs> than with Oral Roberts. <laughs> I think probably, yeah, yeah, they'd have a lot more in common. Yeah. Um, a question came in from uh, Scott in Phoenix. Um, he says, uh, I keep coming back to the simple ideas of surrender and compassion. Surrender to the isness and compassion towards myself when I fail. James Finley, Jim Finley, says something about love stepping out and setting this high bar down on the ground so that I may trip over it and fall headlong into God. Can my practice be this simple? Yep. <laughs> Nice, nice answer. Yeah. Yep. That high bar of love on the ground is about as good as it gets, and it's absolutely real. Good. Okay. Um, all right. Let's go back to non-duality a little bit here for a bit. Um, there's some nice little quotes that just jumped out at me as I was reading your book. You see oneness because you see from oneness. I'll just read a few of these and you just jump in if you want to comment on them. That's one. Yeah. A, a mind that does not need to separate and exclude in order to perceive reality will encounter far less resistance in the current of life and, and inflict far less violence on others. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
These are, these are the Cynthia Sutras here. Um, <laughs> Non-dual does not mean renouncing the capacity for critical thinking. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big one for many people that they they learned uh, again back in the '90s when I first came out to 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 be with Thomas Keating and and Snowmass. There was this sort of I would think it's almost a kind of marijuana drug culture simplicity that any attempt to use the rational mind was dualism mm -hmm. and uh, any time any any attempt to drive fine intellectual arguments or or to hone to in any use of those uh, was dualistic yeah and so and so what was non-dualistic was just kind of holding hands and saying we're all one kumbaya yeah yeah, kumbaya kind of, but but it's still we don't realize that many of the the finest Christian thinkers and some of those ones that you named that you said I don't know who they are Beatrice mm -hmm. Bruto and Bar mm -hmm. Bruno Barnhart, yeah. beautiful twentieth twentieth century examples of non dual thinkers mm -hmm. uh, with very very finely tuned critical minds, you know and. We just need to realize that non-dualism is not an excuse for intellectual laziness. Yeah, same is true in the Eastern traditions. I mean, Shankara had a brilliant intellect and wrote these deep, penetrating commentaries with big, long sentences of that you had to very be really clear to follow the logic and so on. He was exactly. He's the founder of Vedanta, and I mean, Avana, how do you pronounce his name? Avinav Gupta, who is one of the the founder of Kashmir Shaivism. Same thing, brilliant mm -hmm. intellect. So there's just no, no conflict, and you know, it doesn't. Living non-duality does not necessarily mean dumbing it down uh, on the understanding level, intellectual level. Exactly. Exactly. My, my. Metaphor. I use this many times, but it's still such a good metaphor that I, I keep coming back to it. It's an image, actually. I, the image of uh, the stained glass window mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the undivided light somehow or another gets itself into bits and pieces and they're red and orange and yellow and little trays. And the stained glass window maker assembles them into a beautiful, beautiful uh, window like the rose window at, at Snowmass Monastery mm -hmm. uh, using his craft to do so, uh, her craft, and creates this beautiful artifact with all these little bits and pieces of color. But it's only when the light rises, the sun in the morning and hits and backlights the window that the whole thing comes together. Mm. And you see the active dance between the particularity, the, the created light and all the bits and pieces being harmonized and brought to a high, uh, much more intense level by the, the white light that, that comes through it. And I think it's a perfect image to me of how uh, the non-dual and the dual, the infinite and the finite work together to mutually enhance each other's capacities and domains mm -hmm. uh, so that the Non-dualism doesn't mean, oh, we're not going to deal with the color tray, we're not going to deal with the fine glass artist, we're not going to make pictures, we're just going to sit out here and bask in the uncreated light. Uh, you have to get in there and, and, and struggle and create and take on the conditions of this life and the conditions of this planet, uh, jagged edged as they may be, because something is being woven through them. Uh, that is not simply a return to an original purity, but is a pulling along of finitude into some sort of transformed or alchemized uh, infinitude. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the the non-dual vocation, I think, to me, is really about learning to jump into life and allow the light to flow through it as a harmonizing oneness in whatever particularity you find yourself in. Yeah. And if I could uh, translate that into real simple terms, maybe, um, non-duality, if it's truly a living experience, is, is not going to sort of reduce life to being simplistic. It can be and can and needs to be lived in the midst of all the complexity of modern day life and will only um, help to enhance life and help us deal with its problems, much as uh, nourishing the root of uh, a tree is going to enable the whole tree to flourish. We, exactly. We, yeah, we, you, we, is that sort of along the lines of what you were saying there? 
Very much so. And yeah. I think so many of the models that we've we've used in the past, I don't know whether this is true in the East, but certainly in the West, have sort of been agrarian models of contemplation and non-duality. You get up on a beautiful mountain in a beautiful mountain valley and you ponder the vast starriness of God and you feel the expansiveness of your soul. Uh, all real good, but it doesn't, it doesn't uh, speak much when you're actually in the conditions of the slums, when you're in when you're in, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, non-dual spiritual culture is anti-technology, mm -hmm. it's anti-present, uh, and I think it's one of the reasons why it's not attracting young people, at least in Christianity, the way it is, because if this if this higher, as we're calling it, higher consciousness is going to be worth its moxie at all. Uh, it's got to be able to get in there and actually count for something in the ordinary, you know, currents of life. Mm -hmm. it, it can't seek refuge in the places where the currents aren't flowing because the current is life. Yeah. Uh, it, it's one of the reasons why I took it on when we ran into the challenges around, you know, getting our computers so that <laughs> Skype would run on my computer uh -huh. and so that, you know, uh, a couple of trips to Ellsworth, Maine and, you know, and some money and technological things. And, and I thought, well, I could have said, oh, I'm a non-dual master. I don't I don't bother with this technology. <laughs> but yeah. I said, you know, that's just intellectual laziness. This is the challenge. These are the terms of of working in this world and the conditions we're working on and you either take it on or you don't take it on. Yeah, and as it is, the computer guys told you that doing that upgrade that I forced you to do um, <laughs> extended the life of your computer a couple of years. So. Yeah, I know. I mean, that's the best hundred <laughs> bucks I ever spent. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, just speaking of this whole, well, on this same topic, you know the word yoga really means non-dual, it means union. And there's a, the line in the Gita which is, um, yoga is skill in action. So it doesn't mm -hmm. mean yoga is sitting on a mountaintop staring at the clouds. It means, you know, whatever you have to do, you'll do it more skillfully if you're established in non-duality. Truly established. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Here comes a question from uh, Cynthia in Oregon. Uh, she asks, and this is a little bit long, but it's a good one. In awakening recognition, there is an experience of the self, capital S, being all, and therefore no separate deity. Yet there is still for me an inclination to occasionally pray or communicate to that which is being capital b through all without a living guru i speak to something greater than my appearance does prayer or a heart's calling to something greater even within the, the self as self capital s have an effect is it heard and responded to by a greater awareness nice question cynthia very nice question. Very subtle question, and I think it it cuts right to the chase of uh, of of one of the kind of most dysfunctional myths that we've brought along when uh, when you know Western seekers awakeners. Uh, began to jump sort of willy-nilly into models that were just emerging from the East. So we get the idea that the non-dual is the top of the pinnacle and all these sort of provisional transitory senses of selfhood are simply unreal. Mm -hmm. And once you hit non-dual and recognize your oneness with the all, you never go back again. And those other kinds of prayers of like getting down on your knees and saying, Lord, help me, uh, uh, you know, are no longer valid conveyors of truth, but there are just seen as, you know, immature. Mm -hmm. We still have a lot of that thinking, but I think the fact is it's all, all the time. That, that we human beings, as long as we're in human skin, are always mediating in a creative way, like honeybees between the finite and the infinite. And and as Ken Wilber pointed out so brilliantly, another of his many helpful tools in his spirit in first, second, and third persons, uh, he points out that that whole channel of thouness, that, that whole channel of, of, of adoring and a worshiping and being devoted is not, as it's often construed, an immature channel. It's not something that you outgrow when you realize your oneness with the all, but it's a very, very real participation in the heart energy and the basic intimacy of the field that, that the felt sense nature of the universe, of I-ness, of realness, is thou-ness. Mm -hmm. 
and we never transcend it. And when we become so arrogant as to say, I am the all, and then there's nothing left to bow the knee of the heart to, uh, you've simply frozen. Uh, hmm. That, that we have to move in these lower levels of selfhood, uh, these more provisional ones, are extremely not only useful but sacred as channels uh, for the energy of adoration, devotion, and humility, which are the life-giving, transforming substances that what are the life of this planet. Nice. Um, you know, I don't know if people realize this, but all the sort of non-dual heroes that people refer to these days, such as Ramana, Mah you know, Nasargadatta, Papaji, Shankara, all of them, they were all very great devotees. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, either to different aspects of God, such as Kali or Shiva or this or that, or to their own gurus or whatever, but um, they were really into devotion. And, um, and, and Shankara actually said, he said, the intellect imagines duality for the sake of devotion. So there was it seems that there was a sweetness in devotion that they didn't want to miss out on, and here's an exactly. interesting here's an interesting quote from uh, Nisargadatta, which you know, everyone knows who he is. He said, "Forget I am that." He said, "I realized so much more since then. It's so much deeper." He said that shortly before his death. Yeah, yeah, that Raymond Panikkar, the great Christian non-dual master, said, you know, he realized that he was uh, he was the thou of an I. In other words, that he was not, he was not the I, and God was the Thou, but that that God, the the great I, had called him into Thouness. It was a beautiful kind of realization that that both of these paths wind around each other. Yeah, that's great. And uh, I, well, it pretty much covers it. But I, just one one little thing I'd like to throw in is that. Um, you know, we have all these faculties, right? We were talking about the intellect earlier and how yeah. non-duality does not um, obviate or ob obliterate the in intellect. And we also have the heart. Now, actually, I want to talk to you about the heart now, so this is a good segue. Um, but full development or enlightenment or whatever we want to call it is probably going to be conducive to the blossoming of all these faculties. And so when the heart blossoms, there's naturally going to be devotion. So it's not only is non-duality not incompatible with devotion, but it's actually conducive to it. Exactly. And I've, I've come to realize more and more that one of the reasons why Christian languaging hangs on so much to the language of the devotional is because it's bearing witness to the fact that, that in Christian tradition, non-duality happens as the mind gets into the heart. Mm -hmm. And when one perceives in entrainment with the heart, what one experiences, the felt sense equivalent of that is intimacy. Yeah. So it speaks of, uh, you know, and one of the reasons why Christianity hangs on so stubbornly to its devotional and therefore theoretically dualistic language is because it's bearing witness to the, to the emotional signature of a universe seen through the heart. Mm. Let's talk about about the heart now, because um, you write about a lot about that, and uh, and you know there's this putting the mind in the heart that you refer to, and you can explain that. Yeah. Ramana talked about self inquiry, but he actually located the 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 self if you had to locate it someplace as being in the heart, you know, slightly to one yeah. side and so on. I heard you say a similar thing. So let's let's go on for a bit about the heart. And you take it away. I mean, just uh, what what can you tell us? What is what is meant by the heart in your teaching or the teachings of those who you have been following? And uh, what does it mean to put the mind in the heart? Okay. Well, there's a couple of major major truths here. First of all, sharing you know the greater Western tradition, including uh, particularly Sufism. Christianity and and I think in in the Kabbalah as well the the heart is an organ of spiritual perception. Mm -hmm. It's it's first and most important function is to see, and we get this right out of Jesus in the Beatitude: "Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God." And over and over the the Sufi tradition really really takes this to a fine uh, fine point. That, and they have a, a very elaborate teaching about the sheaths of the heart, the layers, the veils of the heart. But it's clear that, that this is the organ of spiritual sight, that this is the noetic organ, that it doesn't have to do with the, the brain. It's, uh, it's the brain 
in the heart. And the the second aspect of this... Let me ask you here, are we talking about yeah. the physical heart muscle, the heart chakra, or what are we referring to? That's, yeah, that's where I'm going to. Okay, um, we're, we're talking about the physical heart okay. to begin with, you know, that we're... Uh, and that uh, in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, uh, which is where they developed the most uh, subtle and consistent teaching of the mind and the heart. It's clear that they're talking about the physically enfleshed heart. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the heart, you know, there's actually a wonderful little quote that I quote somewhere in the book about one of the guys talking about the Holy Spirit residing in one of the upper, you know, chambers. upper chambers. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So... And it's very clear when the with the attentional practices that that accompany the the prayer, the Jesus prayer, the prayer of the heart, that there is an attention actually bringing bringing our attention and allowing it to collect in the region of the physical heart. So we're not talking about a metaphor for um, for the center of the person or the seat of the soul, or we're we're talking about a a, a connection with the embodied heart. Mm -hmm. uh, the the Western tradition, by and large, does not uh, deal in the chakra language. That uh, they they would not, you know. So you're not going to find anywhere in the Eastern Orthodox talking about uh, about the heart versus the heart chakra. Mm -hmm. It's all clearly uh, talking about the physical heart. There's no there's no explicit recognition of a heart chakra uh, that whether there's an implicit recognition is an open question uh, and when you uh, you know Robert Sardello who has explored this very very deeply from the contemporary sort of uh, phenomenological point of view is very clear that that he's talking about the physical heart and he believes the texts are as well not the heart chakra um, one one writer who I haven't met personally, but as a very interesting uh, commentator, Olga Lukachova, who uh, who studied uh, the the Jesus prayer, the prayer of the heart, from Orthodox masters, and also did some work with the uh, with the Vedanta teaching, uh, is much more open to talking about the, the the chakras and also the 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 chambers and the nerve nexuses on either side, but. I think for the point of view of the where the Christians have to get over the hump is to understand we're talking about a physically embodied heart, something actually in your being, in your body, that serves as the on-site uh, transmission, <laughs> receiving and transmitting station uh, for the the conscious awareness, a, a you know a dipole with the brain. And the heart math folks were on to very quickly, not too systematically, but, 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 you know, they got the idea that the mind and the heart is about entraining the, you know, the vibrational rhythms of the, of the brain to those, the greater rhythms of the heart. And when that happens, you can see very clear neurological effects of, of coherence and, and a whole different way of thinking. So, uh, the science needs a lot of calibrating yet, uh, but, I think the important thing is to say that we, uh, that as we learn to bring felt sense awareness to the region, region of the heart and allow that to be the place uh, where this new operating system is grounded, a lot of what the tradition is saying begins to make sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in my own experience, just, it's like, you know, when I have, when, when I am experiencing my heart, it's obviously much more than the physical muscle. And, and mm -hmm. whenever I think of anything, including the body, I think of its gross and subtle dimensions. So yeah. e even though chakras and all that may not be a, a thing in the, in the Western, in Western tradition, doesn't mean they're not real or that we don't yeah. have a subtle body or that there's not a subtle kind of correlate to every gross form. Exactly. There, yeah. there manifestly is. And the, the Western tradition has been slow to emphasize that because it's, uh, it's always been a little bit spooked about talking about energy. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but I think that it's becoming more and more clear that this, these, these, you know, even as we understand how the heart works, it's an electromagnetic resonator much more than a pump. That it's dealing with, you know, energy bandwidths. Yeah. Um, you also say in your book that the heart is an organ of spiritual perception. Its primary function is to look beyond the obvious. And, I, and obviously that's rather absurd if we're just talking about the blood pumping muscle. <laughs> you know, exactly. how could that be? Exactly. Any, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, so um, here's another thing you say, which I, I think will help our discussion. You say that the heart seems to mediate between our individual self and a universal process while being representative of that universal process. So it almost sounds like you're describing it as a sort of a, a lamp at the door between the universal and the individual. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, and, and in that I'm spinning off of a wonderful line from Joseph Chilton Pierce, mm -hmm. who really thought, uh, who's, who really sees the heart as the ombudsman of divine love in a person, whereas the mind is the ombudsman of our individual particularity. Mm -hmm. It's not very scientific, but it's a lovely image to think of the heart in anything as the ombudsman of, di ombudsman of divine love. Uh, Explain kind of, that word for those who might not have English as their native language or whatever. Ombudsman. Well, ombudsman, of course, yeah, is the one in a, in a university system or a corporation is the one who's really appointed to be your, uh, your, your, your supporter, your defender uh, proactively uh, to champion your cause, uh, okay. your spokesperson, your, you know, your DA. Uh. <laughs> And you say, the heart needs to be purified. It gets jammed by lower level noise, the passions, which divide it. A heart that is divided by competing inner agendas. I love this. A heart that is divided by competing inner agendas is like a wind-tossed sea, unable to reflect on its surface the clear image of the moon. Yeah, yeah. And of course, in the, in the classic tradition of the West, which was in in effect up to at least the 19th century the passions didn't mean your drama it didn't mean your joie de vivre or your vital alan like we now see it today passion is a very specific even technical word essentially meaning stuck emotions mm -hmm. it's a lot of emotion a lot of energetic turbidity and turmoil uh, stuck around a fixed agenda or fixed sense of self. Mm -hmm. So your classic emotions, if you if you look at even the AA, mad, bad, sad, glad, you notice they all have a point of view in them. They're all with regard to me. Uh, you know, and what's bad for me makes somebody else glad. Mm -hmm. So when things get stuck and when they get, uh, when they get, when, when the feelingfulness, the flowingness of, of, of that energy gets stuck around a personal agenda, particularly an unconscious one or a very identified one, then you get stuck in the situation called the passion. And what that does classically, it's a, it's a direct quote from, the, the, from one of the great desert fathers or the Russian fathers in the Falakalia, the problem with the passions is they divide the heart. Mm. In other words, they make it incapable of functioning uh, in, its, in its primary function as uh, an organ of sight. And when Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, he doesn't mean blessed are those who don't have sex, for they shall see God. <laughs> purity, in, purity in heart meant undividedness. It meant the field was not... Uh, parceled out and, and entrapped and held held captive to the passions. Yeah. So a lot of the work was teaching what in the in the East has the wonderful name non-identification, uh, equanimity, uh, the capacity not to not to reactively grab onto things and make it all about me, all about my drama. Because when you do that, uh, you're you're sabotaging the capacity of the heart <coughs> to really process uh, cosmic feelingfulness. Nice. And in your book you say, attention of the heart is attained not by concentration, 
but by letting go of all mm. that one is clinging to, that would be the passions, I guess, relinquish, yeah, relinquishing the passions and relaxing the will. So that kind of brings us full circle to what we were talking about before with centering prayer and meditation, which is exactly. a, a kind of a surrendering process of releasing the grip, like you, you, you demonstrate yeah. by dropping a pencil or something, you know, how hard is it exactly. to do that? Exactly, yeah. Um, that's what centering prayer is, it's releasing the grip. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the one of the two joysticks, if you wish, for 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 really beginning to move towards the new program. Because when you let go of that which you're grabbing or which is more likely grabbing you, then uh, then you're clear, clearing the space and you're returning the the heart to its pure or if you want to call it that virgin state of non-attachment. So that's that's the practice. That's the piece that centering prayer captures and works on so brilliantly that classic repeated small teaching people to let go when they're trapped mm -hmm. to let go when they've grabbed on and when you begin to learn to do that in the laboratory of meditation just practicing releasing 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 it has carryover value into life you begin to spot more carefully when you're getting seized in the grip of a of an anger or an entitlement or a self-justification or a you know, and you do the same thing because it's come to represent prayer to you. Prayer is release. Uh, and so then you're really working that. The other joystick, of course, is the concentrating of attention at the sensate level in the region of the heart, which is an advanced practice which should most likely be done under a guide. It traditionally has. But those two together, uh, the, the letting go of the attachments, which is the preparatory for recognizing and letting go of passions, keeping your heart clean, keeping your heart virgin, uh, is, uh, is really supremely the work of centering prayer, mm -hmm. which sets us up to move into, the, uh, into that, that sight, that, that organ of luminous sight, impregnated with love because it's in the heart. And I, suggest, I would surmise that, you know, if your heart isn't clean and virgin, then somehow cleaning it and restoring its, its uh, integrity and purity. Right. And, and these are not great... Because there could be a lot of detritus that has accumulated, you know. Yeah. And it's, it's moment by moment. And, uh, you know, if you take virgin and pure and clean not to be idealistic states, but as a and a nanosecond and something that's always moving, we're attached or unattached. And in every instant we're grabbing on and letting go and grabbing on and letting go. So so the the use of the word virgin, which is my word, is is simply to say it it it, it looks at the place where we've let go, where we're not grabbed or grabbing or entitled or clinging or clutching. Mm -hmm. uh, either to something really simple like a thought or a state that we prefer or anything, but we're able to just be there with the is. That's the virgin state, the, the state of equanimity. Uh, and the the impure, which we fall into, we tumble into it, you know, almost with every breath, is the, the grabbing, the fixated, the clinging, the insisting, the, all that. So it's flow, it's not one or the other. Neither one can be a steady state without the other, at least in this life, I think. But as we're more quick to recognize when we get trapped and pulled back into the small self and the heart goes offline like my television camera uh, because its, its energy is being absorbed in the passions, if we recognize that a little bit more clearly, then we can move back to it uh, much more quickly into a state where we're in touch with those non-dual currents and moving with the skillful skill and action of the yoga. Yeah. I would suggest that uh, even though it is a moment-to-moment -moment process, um, at the same time, it is a phenomenon that um, the heart and the nervous system in general accumulates impressions, deep impressions, yeah. and that there can be, uh, and that the more burdened one is by those impressions, deeply rooted, the more inclined one will be to sort of act re re reactively or impulsively or inappropriately and, and so on. And so, you know, we have our work cut out for us as, as a long-term project to progressively, even though there's a moment-to-moment -moment thing to be done, there's a, also progressive uh, purification yeah. to be accomplished. 
Exactly. And and you watch it, the mature people who put in their years in the journey. Uh, I would say that that I've noticed a couple of stages. First of all, the the moments of pure pellucid seeing and presence tend to come more often and last a little bit longer. But the other thing is that there's a greater alertness and recognizing when you're getting caught uh, and and shifting. Yeah. A greater ability to see. And because of that, kind of paradoxically, there's less fear of falling. Mm. And I think this is really important because a lot of us are really afraid to fall. And so we try and maintain this kind of artificial high purity of the enlightened. Uh, I think that's great when you're in your 60s, but for the ones that get older and you watch them growing, uh, they, they're they totally not afraid to be essentially simply human mm -hmm. because they know that quickly they can, you know, they can smell from the inside when it's gotten caught. So it's a, it's got a different quality to it. Yeah, someone asked Ms. Sargadada about that, you know, whether you get caught up in things like we do. And he said, yeah, but only for a moment and then I'm back. Uh, whereas you yeah. might you might get caught up for days or something. Yeah, exactly. I think exactly. one way of understanding that is if I used this analogy before, but if you could, if you could sort of like, if you're at the if you're at the source of a river, theoretically you could send the river off in any direction. Whereas if you're way down halfway downstream or at the mouth of the river, it's too late. The river has this momentum and it's already gone run its course. Exactly. So if you don't catch the impulses of desire and thought until they're way expressed it's too late to redirect them. But if you can sort of reside at that level from which they arise, then you're kind of at the master switchboard. And, and without being manipulative, you have the, a simple, gentle shift of attention or will can send life off in a completely more appropriate direction. Exactly. And what happens is the river of the, the lived life will catch up with you and carry you at some point. So mm -hmm. that, so that uh, I've always been a little bit reluctant about having people cut off experience too quickly. Sometimes you've just got to go through a bad day and deal with all the things mm -hmm. and it'll come out the, the it'll be because it's periodicity as the next day. It's not going to solve itself naturally in 24 hours. Right. So you just realize, okay, I'm going to be fragile. I'm going to be vulnerable for the time. Don't take it seriously. And uh, allow things to have their natural swing without always using your spiritual practice to correct back too fast, which becomes a kind of repression, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you want to be spontaneous and natural, by all means. Yeah. 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 Good. Well, we've covered a lot. Um, I'm sure we, yeah. could, we could probably do another two hours, but not right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> time to, it's probably your lunch time. Yeah, it's getting there. Um, so, yeah. do you have any thoughts that you'd like to wrap up with? Well, nothing in particular. I mean, I, I'm thrilled to know that I'm going to be seeing you at the Sand Conference in a couple of weeks now. Yeah, that'll be fun. Maybe we can come to each other's yeah. talks if we're not otherwise engaged. Hopefully, that'll be great. I, and I really appreciate, you know, I waited through that wonderful biographies and program titles and contents that you put together in such a usable form. It's going to be quite the conference. It will be, yeah. I do that because it's impossible to figure it all out otherwise. There's so many things going on at the same time. So I always create this program that I can so quickly scan. <clears throat> yeah, it's so great. It's like, how many non dualists does it take to change a life goal? Yeah, right. <laughs> I may send an update to that, actually. Um, all right. Well, thanks. There's, there's a fellow who's been watching the chat named Jeremy who made a nice comment. What an extraordinary teaching. Thanks, Cynthia, for a truly illuminating experience. So that's a good oh, way to conclude that's here. That's great. Yeah. Great. Good. Wonderful. Well, I think I know who that Jeremy is, so I'm sending greeting, greetings. Good. Well, go out and enjoy your sailboat. And uh, okay. it sounds like a fun thing to do. Um, I spent a year at a prep school in Massachusetts when I was a teenager and did a lot of sailing on Buzzards Bay. Uh, ah, okay. With a fellow, and the fellow I did it with was it was from Maine, actually. So. Ah, well, all right. Yeah. I will think of you as I get the boat off of its morning. Good. All right, so let me just make a couple of concluding remarks. Um, you've been watching an interview with Cynthia Bourgeau on Buddha at the Gas Pump. Um, this is an ongoing series. Uh, go to batgap.com and check out the menus and uh, you know, see if there's anything there you'd like to do, like 
sign up for the email or sign up for the podcast or donate or you know anything else um, there's not too many it's not too complicated just check out the different menus and uh, see you next week next week I'll be interviewing another woman with a French name uh, Vera de Chalambert <laughs> I'm on a roll here and uh, I think she'll be very interesting she's also associated with the sand conference I I was reading one of their emails and I thought this is so beautifully written who wrote this and I, I checked with Maurizio and he said oh it was Vera so I thought I've got to talk to Vera so I'll be doing that next week. Oh yeah, I, she interviewed me for something once. It was she's just lovely. Yeah, you know, just such a gentle, heartful, beautiful soul. So yeah. you should have fun. I will. Yeah. Maybe thanks. I'll tune in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do it, please. Okay. All right. So thanks everybody. Okay. We'll see you for the next one. Thanks, Cynthia. Sure. Bye, Rick. Thank you. You're welcome.